Welcome to the Stikoa Valley Cultural Arts Center. My name is Amber Benden, and today I'm speaking with Darren Nicholson of Balsam Range. Let's start with that idea of this Bluegrass All-Stars concert series and tell me a little bit about the idea behind that and who you have coming with you out to Stikoa. Well, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, it's Mark Pruitt, the great Western North Carolina banjo player, um, the great Audie Blaylock, who has a long history with uh, bluegrass music, multiple award winner, Grammy nominated, and Reed Jones playing bass. We did a series of these collaborative shows earlier in the year, and they were received so well that we were approached about doing other dates and had a hole in the calendar. And the first place I thought of was Tacoa Valley, and I would love to bring that show back out there. It's been a long time since I've been out there, and I always love performing there. And um, there's a group of of people who come to see us out there that don't, you know, that don't come to see us anywhere else. And it's just a great, a great venue that would fit that show. Well, we are looking forward to having you. And I, for one, you kind of started my job off, right? Just a couple of weeks in when I got a call from Darren Nicholson of Awesome Range. And I thought, wow, this job's going to be interesting. Tell me a little bit, Darren, about your background and kind of your musical biography. What was it like? When did you learn to play? And What's that story? I was at my mother's house uh, yesterday. I went and and uh, and had uh, lunch with her. I actually, my mom's she's she's slowing down a lot, and it, she's either on, on a walker or a wheelchair uh, most of the time. And so I went by and I, and I made lunch for her yesterday. We can eat breakfast anytime. So we had <laughs> breakfast for lunch. We can have breakfast for supper. I like that a lot. But yeah. Um, I'd, I'd made breakfast uh, about two o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> for me and my mother, and she started pulling out um, all these old pictures. She had found these things from when I was in school, and, and in, I went to school in Jackson County. Okay. Um, I was raised in a little community called Tuckasegee. I went to, uh, they had a thing called Head Start, which was where kids went before kindergarten. It's mm -hmm. kind of like preschool, I guess, and there was a community called Little Canada, and there was my picture and this biography that had, my mother had, had asked me all these questions about what I wanted to do at three and a half years old. And I wanted to be a singing star. That's what I told her. And so uh, my history with music goes back that far. I love bluegrass and country music, old time, any kind of roots music. There's a big umbrella they call Americana. And I guess that's what I am because the uh, um, I love all those things, um, yeah. but uh, that's that's also what our house was. Our house was Americana because everybody in my family played music to some level. And on Friday and Saturday nights, all the furniture would be pushed back and there'd be a house full of people and there'd be banjos and electric guitars and fiddles and there'd be everything from gospel music to country music to bluegrass. And then my family would play shows all around Western North Carolina. And so that was my childhood. And so I've been performing on stage with my family and my parents and performing as long as I can remember. So that that's my introduction to this. It's just a way of life, really, for me. I've never looked back. Yeah, you didn't sound like knew anything any different. Uh, I didn't realize that you played with your with your family and traveled. So tell me about your family band and what that was like growing up. My dad played old time fiddle and played he loved bluegrass but he also played electric guitar and uh he played he loved honky-tonk music and so uh a lot of people from jackson county um uh, in particularly in western north carolina they went out west in the 50s and 60s to seattle to that area uh to be in the logging boom yeah. and they were logging just like people from east tennessee and virginia went to detroit to work in the automobile industry um, you know, there people from the South were moving out and, and going to find jobs. And when they did, they took the music with them. And that's and so, my family went to the textile industry out in McConville, Gastonia. Oh, Same yeah. thing. Yep, exactly. Ohio, a lot of bluegrass ended up in Ohio and Kentucky or Northern Kentucky because of, you know, um, people taking this music out of the, the mountains. But when my dad was out on the West Coast, he would play old time fiddle tunes and dances, but he would also play, that's when Buck Owens and Merle Haggard were just hot as a match out there. So 
So uh, when my family listened to the Grand Ole Opry, the Grand Ole Opry was perfect because there would be a country artist, but then there'd be a bluegrass artist right behind it. And there wasn't this segregation of this is bluegrass or this is country. You know, it was just like, hey, this is Bill Monroe and Jim and Jesse. This is good. And then it would be like, hey, this is George Jones and this is Connie Smith. This is good, too. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, country and bluegrass music didn't until I got older and realized that people even argued about what bluegrass is. I, I didn't realize there was a difference. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, because they came from the same roots, maybe you're right that that segregation came later in the history of the music. Uh, most of the time that the that bluegrass, when people have debates about what is country music and bluegrass, it's usually from somebody who is not from where the music is from. And it's somebody that learned about it. It's some college professor from New York who got interested in bluegrass and all of a sudden he's an expert, you know, as opposed to, you know, the people who've dedicated their life to it. They don't ever think about it. They yeah. don't think about it in terms of what it is. They just they just play it, you know. Yeah. And um, and so later on, people when outsiders started getting interested in, in bluegrass and it started going to the masses, people tried to to start figuring out what what is bluegrass and what isn't. But that's another that's a whole nother discussion for another day. But but that kind of music was around my my whole life. And I, and I just love it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So who were your big influences kind of as you were forming your own place in the music world and kind of separating from maybe your family a little bit? Who were your influences? Yeah, well, that's a and it goes in stages too. early on. It was it's who you're around. You know, it was my family, local pickers that were really good. Then as I progressed and started getting in, listening to more kind of advanced players, getting to be around more advanced players. Uh, in the local scene here, um, there was a fiddle player named Arvel Freeman because I played fiddle early on. Uh, I really took to his music. Mark Pruitt was a huge influence early on. And, uh, and then when I, in my late teens, I got hooked up with a guy named Steve Sutton and uh, he changed my life and changed my career. He and Mark played together for years at a place called Bill Stanley's Barbecue in Asheville, but he was a phenomenal musician and that's how actually how I met Audie Blaylock years ago but Steve pushed me to that next level he got me my first job at the Grand Ole Opry when I was 18 years old I started traveling to Nashville with him and then being around musicians at that level um, as a kid I was just like a sponge I was wanting to learn trying to pick up everything I can so not not only a mentor about the music but also the music business you know those were my hands-on influences as far as what I was listening to, mm -hmm. um, people I, that I didn't know that influenced me. Oh, gosh. Um, George Jones, Jerry Lee Lewis. In the bluegrass world, the, the Osborne brothers, that was what brought me back to bluegrass. I remember the Osborne brothers. I think what connected me with them is they sounded like bluegrass and country music. And they blended the two. And I'm like, that's the sound I've been searching for my whole life. That's the marriage of the two kinds of music that I love so much you know and the great harmony singing that was a that changed everything for me yeah so tell me how you went went from there you know you're you're young you're 18 you're getting around more professional musicians around the Grand Ole Opry and then tell me about Balsam Range and where that kind of enters into the storyline and I did that I did the traveling for three years out of Nashville with a Alicia Nugent band and during that time I got to do so many incredible things. We opened for Merle Haggard. I recorded with Allison Krauss. We did a bunch of, I did a bunch of records with the great Carl Jackson. I was just a young kid who knew nothing, just a sponge, you know, just taking all this in, getting experience. And then in uh, 2006, that started in early 2004. And by the end of 2006, I was coming off the road because my son, who was about to turn five, was starting school and I didn't want to be traveling. I wanted to be home with him. And I was just kind of burnt out with the with the traveling thing at the time and just wanted to do something different. And I w worked on a solo record and I found myself at home in Western North Carolina at the end of 2006, releasing this solo record. And at the same time, Buddy Melton had done a solo project. And uh, Mark Pruitt and Tim Surratt both played on those solo records. 
Mark and Tim, you know, there's this, all of a sudden there's these little connections and uh, Buddy came to my office one day. I was working for a bank in Asheville and he came out to my office one day. I was off the road, got a job. I'm like, I'm not going to be traveling, playing music. And then Buddy shows up at my office and wants to go to lunch. And he's like, you know, Mark and I were talking. Him and Tim played on my record and they played on your record. And just wondered if you want to maybe have a jam session and just have some fun and maybe even do a show. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, why not? You know, and so it was a jam session in my kitchen. 15 years later, the band is still going. And that's that's kind of how Balsam Range got started. That seems to be a, the storyline here, right? It's this collaboration that's a part of the way that you work. And it sounds like that's just because of the way that you came into music in the beginning with, you know, this full on immersion. Um, so talk about uh, collaboration for me a little bit because you have Balsam Range that you work with and then you have the Darren Nicholson band and and then you know this all-star group and that's the cool thing about the music the music brings people together and the, com the whole communal aspect of it that's the beauty of it we all develop these relationships here and there that all of a sudden pop up you don't know where something's going to lead but as, as long as you are doing the right things and have good relationships, it doesn't, music is especially so, but in any business, and that's why a lot of people can't make a living playing music. It comes down to this. Life is about developing relationships. Yeah. And it's not necessarily about the music. A lot of people think, hey, well, if I'm the best at this, then I'll just make money at it. And that's not true. You know, it's about developing relationships. It's about doing good business, being on time, treating people right, phone calls, the perfect, the business side of it, like having good relationships with people. There are people who are good musicians that, that I don't call them because I don't like to work with them. You know what I mean? And it's the same yeah. way in any business. There are some people who are great at their job, but you avoid them because like being personable and putting yourself out there and being able to uh, effectively have good relationships will carry you a lot further than your talent will, you know, because I've never been the best talent, the best singer, anything like that. But I've always surrounded myself with good people. And when you do that, when you surround yourself with good people, good things happen. And there's know? a give and a take in that, right? You get like you have an idea and someone else inspires that and it kind of spurs off into something new. And in a team, you know what I mean? If you take one little piece of twine, um, it's only going to be so strong, but several pieces of twine together all of a sudden make a rope. I've always loved collaborating with people and I want to always play with people that are better than me. You know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't. A lot of people want to be the alpha or the biggest fish in, in the pond. There's no growth that way. I want to be the weakest link in the chain because it pushes me to be a better musician. It pushes me to be a better singer. I want to be with people that, that push me, not only musically, but professionally and creatively. I'm always looking for opportunities to be with the people that I admire, you know? Yeah, that sounds a lot like you were talking about when you were first starting out and you were young. You were talking about being that sponge. So, you know, that's a character trait. Where, where does that character trait come from, Darren? Who, who is that influence in your life that uh, huh. shaped that? I, my parents, you know, they're always about working hard and putting yourself out there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like my, my dad, he didn't have a shy bone in his body. You know, he, it was just about not holding back, believing in yourself and pushing and working hard and, and asking, you know, Hey, do you care if I sit in with you? Do you care if I, you, do you want to do this? Do you want to sing on my record? You know, and then all of a sudden, all these the relationships develop over years that, you know, I asked Carl Jackson, I was a nervous wreck. Um, Carl was the band leader in, in Glenn Campbell's band for 10 years, and he's won like 20 Grammys, you know, and he produced some records. And the first time I, the first times I was around him, he's very intimidating. And, and I asked him to sing on my first record years ago. And I was so nervous about that. And because I pushed myself to do that, I mean, I spent an hour on the phone with the guy the other night riding back from the gig. 
I had breakfast with him the other morning when I was in Nashville. He's became one of my best friends. We've done a dozen records together since then. And it's, and it's about just trying. And I, I, I love that saying you, uh, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Yeah. I think that's true. And I'm an artist, not a musician, but for me in my life, I found like when something that I want to do kind of catches my breath or, you know, I get this feeling in my chest where there's this pushback. That's the signal. Like you should really try to do that. Like that that's fear that's keeping you from kind of moving forward. You're always comfortable. That means you're not growing. Yeah. You know, and so you, you got to put yourself in a position to be uncomfortable if you're going to get better. The career I've had in my life and, and, there's a lot of it that's very uncomfortable and it's been hard and I've had a lot of failures and a lot of, and a lot of things that I've done wrong, but that's the human experience. We all yeah. mess up and we all, you know, the difference is some people keep trying and some people don't. And that's the biggest thing I got from my parents is just don't quit whatever yeah. you do. Just don't give up. You mentioned the pandemic a moment ago, and that was one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about. What, what have you learned about yourself in the past couple of years and uh, the importance of, of music and coming together? I, I'll, well, I'll say I'll never do it again. No, because I'm, I'm, I'm that human that's just dumb enough to, uh, to do it all over again. But we can take things for granted. I was going to say I'll never take performing live for granted again. But man, we can, um, we're so self-centered. I, I remember doing shows where I, you, you, when you play 200, 300 dates a year, where you're like, I'm just phoning it in. I, I'm playing, but I don't really want to be here. Somebody wants to hear Rocky Top or Free Bird and you're just rolling your eyes and, and the sound's not good or there's this that's not going good and you get a bad attitude. It's like any other job. You know, you get a bad attitude about your job and all of a sudden it's like, you know, all those gigs that I was complaining about, I would love to have those right now. I would love to be out and see those people that ask me the same questions over and over again. Like it's Groundhog Day, you know, (laughs) there's things that used to annoy me. I'm like, I want those. I want to see those people and just perspective and and getting out of my own ego and self-centeredness. If people are really being honest, we always make things about ourselves. And it's really made me get outside of myself and how I feel and think about others and really think about what music is. Am I doing those shows for me or am I doing those shows for those people that are there? Because if somebody wants to hear Rocky Top or Free Bird, that's my job to give it to them and do it and be happy about it as opposed to just rolling my eyes. It's changed my whole perspective on music, playing live, being around people. You know, if I'm not careful, I can get back into that self-centered all about how I feel. It makes me realize that music is that beautiful thing that brings people together. And it's not about me. It's about me being able to play and sing and make somebody else happy. I've gone through a lot of personal changes in my life in the last few years. And all that together has me, um, my fire went out for music. I I just, I wasn't writing music. I wasn't playing. When I would have time off, I wouldn't touch my instrument, no interest. And my career was just stagnant and I was stagnant. My fire had gone out and now I've got this new passion for performing again and uh, collaborating. I'm going in the studio tomorrow. I've got 31 new original songs that I've written that I'm demoing that, that have most of them have came out of the pandemic. And so I'm on fire to play music and make people happy and enjoy my life to the fullest. And that's, that's what I've got out of it. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you and having you here, seeing you in person. Um, this will be my first concert in the auditorium here at the Stiqua Valley Center. Awesome. So and I've missed it so much. I know Mark's missed it. I know Pruitt has a lot of friends over in that area. A lot of folks he went to Western Carolina with. So yeah, uh, I hope to see everybody out. Yeah. Well, talk to us about this phrase that you use sometimes, which is called the good news of bluegrass. What is the good news of bluegrass? Well, you know. I hit on it earlier. A lot of times people don't think they like bluegrass. That's the biggest compliment we get with Balsam Range. People are like, you know, I, I, I'd hate bluegrass, but I like your band, you know, 
And I think they either have a misconception of it or, you know, they've just, they've, you know, not ever seen a, a good representation of it. And so the show that's coming to Stacoa is in your face, adult strength bluegrass, because Audie Blaylock is a machine. If you like traditional bluegrass, there aren't two players in the whole bluegrass world that are better for traditional bluegrass than Mark Pruitt and Audie Blaylock. And Reed and I are, you know, Reed's an incredible bass player and he's schooled in, in every kind of music there is, but it's it, it pushes me to the top of what I can do as far as intensity and serious for real bluegrass. And so this is an exciting show. And if people like bluegrass at all, they'll, it'll be a show for the ages. Once again, the concert is Sunday, June 12th at 7 p.m. at the Stikoi Valley Center. Doors and concessions open at 6 p.m. Tickets are general admission for $18. You can purchase tickets online at stikoavalleycenter.com or by coming in to the Artisan Gallery or by calling 828-479-3364. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Graham County Travel and Tourism, for underwriting this event as a part of the fourth annual Native Azalea Festival. <laughs>